lads and lassies. We're about to start Chapter 8, Emotional Disabilities and Behavior Disorders. Please read the verse on slide 2. Now, go to slide 3. In the past, as we've discussed previously, many people with emotional disabilities were considered as being cursed or they had sinned greatly, therefore God was putting this disability upon them. Of course, we know Jesus healed many people who had demons or mental illness issues, and that's, that's shown all through the New Testament. Um, unfortunately, now, nowadays, many adults still try to embarrass people or ostracize those who have some kind of mental health issue. What about children and teens, though? Well, slide four shows you the three things that must occur for a child to qualify to get help as having an emotional disability in public school. Once again, kind of like learning disabilities, must have an average or above IQ, must be functioning two or more grade levels below their grade placement, and have a diagnosed psychiatric condition. Now, that must be diagnosed by a physician. Okay, not school personnel. Here's a little quiz for you. And I want you to click on the link and look at the videos because you'll learn more about different kinds of mental health issues if you do that. And try to skip those commercials. I'm not promoting any of those products. Um, but try to get through and watch the videos for the questions because they'll give you some background information that will be valuable to you. Um, just to know in general, and then, of course, maybe for the midterm, too. Slide 6 gives us some of the characteristics or labels that are used for people who have different kinds of mental health issues. Um, some of these you've heard before, some you may not quite know about. Um, let me go to this word right here, pervasive. Pervasive mood of depression. Hmm pervasive. What does that mean to you? Well, to me, it means that someone has sort of an all-encompassing depression. In other words, it affects just about everything that person will do. It's a serious day of depression that has lasted perhaps six months or more. Now you need to realize it's normal to be depressed about some things. For instance, loss of a parent, a grandparent, a friend, a pet, a relative to whom you were close. It's normal for a child or a teenager or even an adult to go through several weeks of being depressed because of this. However, if the depression is so severe that the person literally cannot take care of their life functions and cannot go to work, cannot go to school, cannot even, you know, just do basic hygiene for oneself, then that's a case where someone really may need to be seeking out some medical intervention. Um, this one, probably familiar, hypochondria, the idea that a person thinks that every small symptom that they may have is going to lead to, you know, some huge diagnosis and it's going to be the end of their life. Uh, a silly example maybe, but you know, oh, I have a paper cut and I'm going to get an infection in that. And they're going to have to amputate my hand and it's probably going to spread through my whole body and then I'm going to die. You know, or every time something's wrong, they have to go to the doctor. Every time some little symptom, a little pain appears. Uh, that's hypochondria. Phobias, you're probably familiar with that term too. Fear of. People have fears of many things, some of which may be highly unusual. And I'll try to uh, bring something to class that will tell you what some of those are. But you know some of the basic ones. Some people are afraid of dogs, cats, snakes, mice, birds, um, people who look different than them, people who have different belief systems than they do or spiritual beliefs. Some people are afraid of folks from other countries. They're afraid of eating certain kinds of foods afraid of being in the dark alone. There are many, many kinds of phobias. Um, best way that seemingly doctors have found to try to help someone overcome that is by gradually 
exposing the person to something that is similar to what they have a fear of and then adding to that and adding to that to where the person realizes you know nothing really bad is going to happen to me um, and eventually hopefully they can conquer the fear but it takes time Schizophrenia, that's a very serious form of mental illness. In that case, the person is often hearing voices, sometimes even has visual hallucinations where they're seeing things that aren't there. A person believes that voices are talking to me and they are telling me what to do. And in some of those cases, we've seen very tragic results, you know, where someone went on a shooting rampage or set their house on fire, killed someone, killed the animals uh, for no reason at all except that we can ascertain it's it's just that they feel that someone or something was compelling them to do that and of course there are medications for people to take who have this serious kind of mental illness another one that can be becomes very serious is bipolar disorder bipolar in bi bipolar disorder excuse me a person has mania or manic spells and then they also have severe depression example would be someone who is in the stage that's known as hypomania they may go out and spend a lot of money that they really shouldn't be spending you know i'm going to go gamble i'm going to fly to vegas spend all my savings flying to vegas and i'm going to put money down on some particular game or number and i'm going to become a multimillionaire because of that well when that does not happen which most likely it won't for the person they begin to realize now I've spent all my money and all my savings and what do I have to show for it nothing so then the person may move into the severe depression state and may stay there for weeks or months at a time and the some of the bad things about some of these conditions like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia are that after a length of time in some cases people's families even turn against them or abandon them because they feel like you know I put up with this for years and every time you get in trouble you call me to bail you out either literally bail you out of jail because you've done some crime or committed some act that caused you to get arrested or you don't have money you can't make your house payments you can't buy food and you always want money from me and so eventually some family members or close friends may decide I'm not going to enable you in those ways anymore you're just going to have to suffer and the person can end up homeless they can end up divorced um, not having their children you know losing custody of their children things like that and there are many many other psychiatric disorders that are told about in the APA manual that we'll mention again later well what are some possible causes of some of these emotional disabilities can be a lot of things can be genetic I'll give you an example among people with schizophrenia many many times they have a parent or grandparent who had schizophrenia there seem to be a strong genetic component to that particular mental health illness if a person is going to develop schizophrenia it usually happens before they're about 25 years old and majority of the time they had a parent or grandparent who had some kind of serious mental health issue and most likely it was schizophrenia even though that person may have never been diagnosed but now do not fear if you do have that in your family history that doesn't mean you will become schizophrenic or have any of these other mental health issues but sometimes it does happen enough that scientists say there's a genetic component to it parent uses drugs okay substance abuse using illegal substances or abusing even prescription medications or something like that obviously if the woman is pregnant or becomes pregnant by a man who's addicted to some kind of drugs it can have an impact on the baby and how the baby's brain and nervous system are going to develop what about learned behaviors if you take a child with average intelligence and that child comes up in a home with a single parent who has a mental illness or two parents my goodness with some kind of mental health issues that child sees how my parent or parents respond in stressful situations and learns that this is what you do if 
every time bills are due and my mother can't pay the bills, I see her go and drink alcohol because that's what her parent did. That may be what I think you do. Unless I'm able to mature enough and rationalize it all and realize she does that because she's addicted to alcohol. I will choose not to do that because I don't want to be that kind of person. I want to have a happy, healthy, normal life. But sometimes there are some things that are learned behaviors. And the child may reenact those things when he or she becomes older. Another possible cause of emotional disabilities can be what we now call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder or syndrome, where the child um, was a victim of some kind of abuse, particularly if it's sexual or psychological or you know physical abuse of some type. There was a lot of stress. Maybe the family was homeless for a length of time. A child was a victim of some crime or, again, loss of a loved one. Um, any of those kind of issues can cause a child to develop emotional problems to some degree. And, of course, even adults. Well, here we go in slide eight, the DSM. American Psychiatric Diagnostic Manual. Okay, within that manual, that association describes the characteristics of the various mental health disorders that we recognize now. When I say requirements, it means that there'll be a list, let's say, of maybe 10 things, and it will say for a person to be diagnosed as being, you know, a drug addict, addicted to cocaine, then they must exhibit six of the 10 symptoms that are listed. That's just one example. And of course, it can be about any other type of mental health issue. This is used by everyone from psychiatrists to special ed directors to nurses and psychologists, people who work in hospitals. It's revised every few years, and it's used in public school to help say, you know, this child does qualify for help as being emotionally disabled because a physician has said this child has X condition, and so we can give him or her some extra help in school. And keep that always in mind, as it says in slide nine, you have to have a diagnosis by a physician or psychiatrist, and of course a psychiatrist is an MD also. You can't just have a school psychologist say that or a special ed director say, oh, I think this person's bipolar. So we'll just put them in special ed. No, you have to go through the appropriate steps so that the child can be properly diagnosed and given the help that is needed. Well, does every child who misbehaves need to be in special ed? You can probably guess that I'm going to say no. Of course, then there are children who might need help but don't get it. That's not very fair. Who's going to decide what this child's illness is or if this child has a behavior disorder or conduct disorder? And to use some of these old terms you see up here, or is the child a juvenile delinquent? In other words, I'm just bad because I want to be bad and I'll steal, lie, cheat, whatever I need to do because I'm very focused on myself and what I want. Is the child socially maladjusted? And who decides all these things anyway? Well, for kind of a humorous look to lighten up a little bit, uh, watch this little segment from um, the movie and the play West Side Story. See if you can count how many people are trying to diagnose the young man in the video. And after that, come back and go to slide 11. I hope you enjoyed that, that song. Um, again, people do not always qualify for special education help because they have bad behavior. Some of the things such as those listed being you know, a child who just misbehaves in school, being a teenager who's aggressive, tries to get attention all the time in class, being disruptive in class or school, that doesn't necessarily mean that the person needs to be in special education. Okay? Now, how do we decide this? Well, again, you'll have a team of people who meet. Sometimes when a child has been diagnosed as being emotionally disabled, the child will get suspended from school. If a 
child is about to be suspended from school for up to a total of 10 days, and that's cumulative, meaning if I was suspended four days in August for fighting, two days in September for stealing, three days in early October for cursing at a teacher, and then four days the end of October for hitting someone repeatedly, oops, we're getting right up there around 10 total days or more of suspension. And we cannot do that in public school. In the case of our state, unless the child is seen to be responsible for his or her actions. How do we decide that? We have what's called a manifest determination meeting. And that is the big thing that's talked about at that. Is this child responsible for his or her actions? Or is their disability so severe that he or she cannot be held accountable. Now, being a former principal and special ed director and holding some other jobs district office level, you can imagine that when I was at these meetings, I was usually trying to say, yes, the child is responsible. Hmm, how do you decide that? Why don't you take a little brain break right now and do something that you enjoy? Whether it's do a little physical exercise, work on a hobby, play some music or something, and then come back and find out how we try to determine this on slide 14. Okay, hope you enjoyed your little brain break. Now we're going to talk about the manifest determination meeting. It's very similar to an IEP meeting in that you have to have a team meet. Usually it is made up of the parent. A school administrator could be principal or assistant principal, possibly a guidance counselor. Um, almost always, you would have the school psychologist there, a special ed teacher there, one or more regular education teachers. And again, that parent, 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 you always want the parent there. And the team will review the child's records. What's the most recent discipline referral? What happened? Can we figure out what causes this child to misbehave or not? Let's look at the psychological report. Is this child intellectually capable of understanding right from wrong? And what our goal is, is to work toward having happy children. The next slide gives you a sample form that you use. Now this part of what the Manifest Determination Committee does is called a Functional Behavior Assessment. Teachers fill out forms that show what is going on with this child and can we figure out why. Now, if I'm a child who has hypoglycemia, that means my blood sugar may drop rapidly and I've had nothing to eat all day and before lunchtime I'm irritable, I'm aggravated, and I hit someone, should we let you continue this behavior? Obviously not. Maybe we start to realize that, hey, this child only misbehaves right before lunch when the child is very hungry. So we need to let the kid have a snack mid-morning and a healthy snack. Could be cheese, some cheese and crackers. It could be fruit, something like that. That's going to be good for the child or whole wheat crackers or, or something like that. Um, if we can figure out if this is happening a certain time of day or what are the triggers, is it when someone calls him or her names, you know, what is it? Maybe we can eliminate those things. The next slide talks about the behavioral intervention plan. Once we've tried to figure out what is causing the misbehavior, then we're going to come up with a plan. The plan is a written document. On it, we will list two or three things that the child needs to do or not do. Let's say one of the problems we have is you steal a lot from other children and they complain about this. Well, then the goal would be, you know, the child will refrain from bothering objects or taking objects that belong to others. Child gets out of the seat ten times in an hour when it's not approved by the teacher. Well, we may start out saying you cannot get out of your seat more than five times in an hour. The way we're going to check this is we're going to have a post-it note on your desk. And every time you get up, when you're not supposed to, the teacher's going to come by and put a mark. And if you get five marks before lunch, that means you do not get to sit by your best friend at lunch. 
If you only have two or three, then you do get to sit with your best friend. And so you try to gradually improve the behavior, not expect the child that, oh, okay, you told me you have a plan, so all of a sudden I'm going to sit in my seat a whole morning or something. I mean, it has to be something kind of logical or reasonable. Um, also, though, explain to the child, these are the punishments. So back to the example of stealing. If you steal things, this is what's going to happen. And it might be in-school suspension. It might be that, you know, your parents are going to be notified and you won't get to pick your favorite show on TV that night or, or whatever it is. But you try to come up with punishments that will be meaningful as well as rewards for the child for good behavior. And again, don't have to be things that cost a lot for you or the teacher or the parent. Um, what are some other strategies that you can use? Well, one time I knew a child who was intellectually disabled, but he also had severe emotional problems, mainly because he was born addicted to cocaine because his mother used crack. So he had some brain damage because of all that. He had a lot of issues with females giving him orders. I'll, I'll state it that way. So if the teacher said, you will sit down and you will do this math and you'll do it right now because I said so, he was going to react probably in an explosive manner. He would do things such as hit other children, throw a desk across the room, and so forth. Well, commanding him to do something did not work. I talked with the teacher. And I said, you know, here are things you can do. Give him a choice. When he comes in in the morning, say, do you want to do your spelling now or your math now? Then after one of those is completed, say, okay, now do you want to do this or this? Make sure he understands by the end of the day, you have to have completed all your work. When I was a self-contained special ed teacher, I had folders for my students. They came in in the mornings and their work was in their folder. They knew that by lunchtime, they had to have completed all the assignments. They could pick which one they wanted to do first. As long as they were all done by lunchtime, I did not really care the order. Although I would sometimes have to pull children aside and let them read to me. But they always seemed to enjoy doing that because they liked the extra attention. So that's just one strategy. Sometimes you can offer children a choice. And uh, that won't always work when it's time to take a test or something. You can't always have a choice about taking or not taking a test. But sometimes you can. If the child feels like, you know, you're listening to me, you're giving me a little leeway here, that may help, particularly in the case of children with emotional problems. Allowing a student a place that they can go if they're starting to feel upset. You know, if I'm angry and I'm agitated and I know that I have a choice, I can either get mad and yell at you, teacher, or I can say I'm getting upset and I need to go see, you know, the example I gave here, Mr. Jim. So the child goes down to Mr. Jim, who's the guidance counselor's office, and sits there for 10 or 15 minutes, and maybe the guidance counselor has time to talk with him or her and resolve whatever the issue is. The child goes back to class. Of course, you have to make sure the child doesn't abuse that privilege by wanting to go every time right before there's a test or some hard work to do. So it takes a little bit of balance to do some of this. Give the child a break time when needed. We all can benefit from a brain break now and then. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, encourage the child. Give him positive feedback, even if it's just a small thing. Um, I'll give an example. One time I used the marble jar technique where I had a jar of marbles. I had it filled, a big jar, like a pickle jar, a big pickle jar. Had it filled up with marbles. I took the marbles out and I told the children, when you're behaving well, I'm going to put marbles in the jar. When the jar is full, you're going to get a surprise and I'm going to let you pick the surprise. Well, the children picked, they want to play baseball on Friday afternoon. They were very good that week. They got on one another's case. You know, hey, be quiet. Listen, do your work. Hurry up, man. Get that finished so we can play baseball Friday. I tried that. They did get to play baseball that Friday, and they were overjoyed. I put the marbles in the jar. When I had a child with some behavior I was working on, and there was one child in particular who talked out a lot and didn't want to do his work. So 
I made sure I put several marbles in the jar every time that he was attentive and on task. So he heard encouraging things from the other children, not just me. And boy, that peer pressure helped him to improve a whole lot. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I know that we can't do those things every week, but we can come up with something different along and along that will help interest the children um, and recognize them for improving their behavior. On the next slide, number 18, there are three state agencies listed that help people with special needs who have emotional disabilities. So take some time and click on those and see what they're all about. Make sure that you, you can name three or four things that each agency does. Continuum of Care, Department of Mental Health, and also our local MUSC, Medical University of South Carolina, and particularly the Office of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So look at those and maybe jot down some notes about what each of those does. Then move on to number 19. On this website, you can learn about some more conditions that may cause a child to be classified as ED. So take a look at it also. And, Go around and click on some of the articles and see about some of the help that's available. What about medications? Well, you've already heard me say uh, <laughs> on, on the PowerPoint for ADD and ADHD. I kind of take umbrage is what the expression is known as with people who just want to always put children on medication because they misbehave. It's important to realize that there are children, though, who have serious psychiatric illnesses, and of course there are adults, too, who need to be on medications, perhaps for even the rest of their lives, but sometimes it may only be for a few months. It just depends on the situation, and again, a physician is the one who has to decide that. So what would you as a teacher have to do? You might have to gather some data for the physician. Again, you might have some kind of chart where you mark down every time the child is doing whatever negative activity seems to get him or her in the most trouble. And you send that to the doctor to show that, okay, the medication the child's on has improved or not improved the behavior. Letting the parent know. <coughs> Excuse me. If the child is misbehaving less or more or appears sleepy or won't eat, or behaviors change so much that you're really concerned about it because of the meds, the parent needs to know so the parent can contact the doctor. Say, hey, maybe this dose is too high for my child. The teacher says he or she is sleepy most of the day. Then the doctor can change the dosage and the child can be more alert. So things like that are really important to do. Okay, here's our last slide. Parent comes to you and asks if the child should be put on medication. What's your response? Once again, it's a friendly reminder. A good response would be, I'm not sure about that because I'm not a physician. I think you should let your child's doctor know what's happening at school. And here's some information you can take to the doctor about your child's outburst or misbehavior. And then you and the doctor can come to a decision about that. If I can help in some other way, though, just let me know. Thank you for listening today, and we'll talk more about emotional disabilities in class.